All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our mock exam series. This is the beginning of mock exam seven. As always, we're going to go through the next set of questions together and break them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Question one. Dennis gets home from the store and starts to tell Mac a story about this guy he met at the store who was giving Dennis recommendations for new movies to watch. Dennis said that the guy recommended four different movies that Dennis had not seen. What concept best describes Dennis's story? Questions you want to ask yourself before going to the answer choices. What do you know? What is the question asking? So what is the question asking here? It's asking about the concept that describes Dennis's story. So what do we know about Dennis's story? Well. Dennis got home from the store and told Mac he met a guy who gave Dennis recommendations for new movies to watch. Dennis said the guy recommended four different movies Dennis had not seen. Now, our answer choices involve the goals of science and ABA, description, prediction, and control. And so we're looking at these in terms of magnitude or authority. Description, you can view it as the lowest level the lowest goal, because description is simply talking about what happened. You're describing what happened. And so what Dennis is doing here is simply describing to Mac what happened at the store. He went to the store. He got recommendations. Prediction is the next higher level where you're going to predict and start to correlate events that occur in your life. So if Dennis starts to predict that if he goes to the store, he's going to get movie recommendations or if he starts to correlate the occurrence of going to the store with recommendations, now Dennis is starting to predict things. He's forming a hypothesis. Finally, control, that's the highest level when we talk about these goals of ABA as a science. Because with control, you've actually done the experiment and you've identified either a functional relationship or experimental control between your independent and dependent variables. Dennis is nowhere close to control yet. He is still very early in his idea of if this were to be an experiment. Is he simply describing what happens when he goes to the store? He hasn't made a hypothesis. He definitely hasn't experimented and established any sort of functional relationship. He's simply describing to Mac what occurred when he went to the store. So what concept best describes Dennis's story, well, that's going to be A, description. A behavior analyst puts together a comparative analysis to change how often her staff cancels sessions. One intervention uses reinforcement and one uses punishment. She takes data for three weeks on each intervention. This scenario is most applicable to what? What's the question asking? The question is asking about this particular scenario and what it applies to. So what do we know about the scenario? Well, we know a behavior analyst has put together a comparative analysis. So immediately we're thinking, well, this is something to do with ABA on how often her staff cancels sessions. One intervention, she uses reinforcement and one, she uses punishment. She then takes data for three weeks on each intervention. So what the behavior analyst is doing is an experiment. She's doing research and not just any experimental research, but applied research because she's doing it for socially valid human behavior. Now, why does that matter? Well, if we consider what the task list wants us to know as far as the domains go of behavior, we have behaviorism, experimental analysis of behavior, applied behavior analysis, and then practice guided by behavior analysis. When you think about behaviorism, think about theory. Think about Skinner's radical behaviorism. That's a theory of behavior. It's a very broad, all-encompassing idea. So when you get a situation like this or a scenario like this, which is much more specific, then we're going to look for a much more specific answer. Because again, behaviorism is our guiding theory, very broad. So we have experimental analysis of behavior next. Experimental analysis of behavior is what we think of when we think of Skinner and his pigeons. Because EAB is typically animal research. It's very controlled in a very contrived laboratory-like setting. This is what we think of when we think of experimental analysis of behavior. 
What happens then is we take some of those results from EAB and we start to go to humans. So we have applied behavior analysis. We're doing research, we're doing experiments in an applied setting with humans. That's ABA. What about practice guided by behavior analysis? Practice guided by behavior analysis is what you might think of as kind of the final step in our domains because we're taking all we've learned from our experiments and starting to actually put them into practice. Think about what our technicians do day in and day out. They're doing or using practice guided by behavior analysis. In this case, we have an analyst doing research and experiments on human and applied setting. So this scenario is really most applicable to what we would call applied behavior analysis. When you think about the different types, think of behaviorism as your theory. Think about EAB in terms of Skinner and his pigeons, very controlled. Think about applied behavior analysis as far as human research goes. And think practice guided by behavior analysis as far as what our technicians do day in and day out. As part of the behavior assessment project, Surratt must write a detailed skill acquisition plan, which includes operational definitions, skill targets, and defined goals. Surratt must distribute her plan to five of her classmates, and they all must interpret the plan the same way, or else Surratt loses points on the project. The grading is based on what dimension of ABA. We have a dimension question here, and with dimension questions, it's very important first that your answer is actually a dimension. Dimension questions are a great fluency check. There are seven of them, and you want to be very specific in that you're not mixing them up with things like assumptions, which can be very easy to do when you first start studying. That being said, the second thing you want to do in dimension questions, be very precise. Dimensions have a lot of crossover, meaning what we describe in our dimensions are very similar to one of each one another. So you want to really get down to the, the crux of the issue of what the question is truly asking about in terms of dimensions. What do we know so far? We know we're looking at the grading. What is the grading based on? So we have this assessment project where Surratt writes his detailed skill acquisition plan with definitions, targets, and goals. She then gives that plan to five of her classmates, and they must interpret the plan the same way, or else Surratt loses points on the project. So the grading is based on what? It's based on the interpretation by her classmates. This is an immediate giveaway to what the answer is if you're fluent. So let's look at our answer choices. A, determinism. So is determinism one of our dimensions? It's not. So determinism immediately out. Again, fluency is so important in these type of questions. What you never want to do is start picking answers because you don't understand the answer. That's not a good place to be. It means you're not fluent enough. Fluency comes first. So determinism is out. What about be effective? Effective says we've made change, but not change just to change, but change that is socially significant and meaningful. Is Surratt being graded on the effectiveness? She's not. She's being interp- she's, she's being graded based on how her classmates interpret the plan. So what she's being graded on is the technological aspect of her plan. Because the technological dimension says we are writing plans and strategies and and behavior plans and skill acquisition plans in a way that can be replicated and done by other trained professionals. So Surratt is looking to make sure her project is very technological. Conceptually Systematic says we're adhering to behavioral principles. We're not really sure what Surratt's goals here are as far as being conceptually systematic because what we're worried about is the grading and what the grading is based on is the student or the classmates interpretation. So basically, Surratt is writing the plan in a way where her classmates will be able to interpret it the same way Surratt does. So Surratt must write it in a technological manner to receive full credit. Taylor's older brother tells Taylor that he should wait at least three days before calling a girl after he goes on a date with her. Taylor's brother recommendation of three days is most like blank, if the end of the date is considered the discriminative stimulus. All right, pretty straightforward measurement question here. We have a question asking about Taylor's brother recommendation of three days. So this appears to be our measurement. And it's relative to what? What's relative to the end of the date? 
which is considered the discriminative stimulus. Now, why is that important to know? Well, because three days can be viewed in many different ways. Typically, three days would, would seem like a length of time. But if you're counting days, you could think of it also as frequency. However, we're looking at the three days in terms of the end of the date being the discriminative stimulus. So let's look at the, the scenario. Taylor, brother, says Taylor should wait three days before calling a girl after he goes on a date with her. So if the end of the date is the SD and Taylor waits three days from the SD to the response, which is calling the girl, we're looking at three days as the time in between the SD and the response. And that's why it's so important that we consider the end of the date the discriminative stimulus, because that helps us pick the most, most correct answer and the best answer here. Again, the discriminative stimulus, end of the date, Taylor waits three days. He then engages in the response of calling the girl. So that time in between the SD and the response is called what? A, into response time. One to response time is time in between responses. Response one to response two, response two to response three. We're not looking at time in between responses here. We're looking at time in between the SD and the first response. So we're, what we're looking at is B, latency. Again, frequency. You might be able to consider three days your frequency if we were concerned with the count. We're not really concerned with the count, though, because Taylor's older brother is giving Taylor a specific amount of time between the date ending and him calling that girl. So the better answer, given our information, is latency. You're always picking the best answer. Rate, of course, is frequency over time. We don't have any rate in this scenario, so rate is out. Given all the information, the best answer here is going to be latency as far as what three days is considered. Two years ago, Dan forgot to save his Word document. And he lost everything when his computer crashed. Now, when Dan is writing in Word, Dan saves every 10 minutes, which prevents him from losing all his work if his computer crashes. What type of consequence is occurring? What type of consequence is occurring? That's what the question wants to know. So it's a consequence question. And with consequence questions, we're typically thinking in terms of reinforcement, punishment, and extinction. So the first place we want to start is asking ourselves, how did Dan's behavior change in the future? His consequences are all about how will they change future behavior. If behavior increases, well, the consequence was reinforcing. Behavior decreases while the consequence was punishing or it was an extinction procedure. In this case, what do we know? We know Dan forgot to save his document and he lost everything. So now when Dan is writing in Word, Dan saves every 10 minutes, which prevents him from losing all his work if his computer crashes. So before, Dan never saved and now Dan saves every 10 minutes. Did Dan's behavior increase or decrease? It increased. So his behavior has been reinforced in some way. We know that for sure. Now, our antecedent is what? Dan writing in Word. The response is Dan starts saving every 10 minutes. What's the consequence? Prevents him from losing all his work if his computer crashes. So what is Dan doing by saving every 10 minutes? What's the consequence of that? He's avoiding losing his work. So what type of consequence occurs as a means of avoidance or escape? Is it A, positive reinforcement, B, negative reinforcement, C, positive punishment, or D, negative punishment? Well, we can immediately eliminate the punishment answers because Dan's behavior wasn't punished. Dan's behavior was reinforced. So is this positive or negative reinforcement? Well, think about what the consequence is. Is something being added or removed? Well, something's being removed. The threat of him losing all his work is gone. Dan is avoiding losing all his work. And so the act of avoidance or the act of escape is tied to what consequence? Well, it's tied to B, negative reinforcement. Now, you might think we went awfully slow for a consequence question. It's because it's practice. Start there. And as you do more consequence questions, they're going to become very, very second nature. And you're going to go through these very quickly. But remember, 
Accuracy is what leads to speed. Speed doesn't create accuracy. Accuracy creates speed. It's more important to be accurate in the beginning. As you get more accurate, you're going to get quicker. Which of the following is not true about extinction? So it's a not true question. Again, those key words, keyword not, don't overlook it. When we get a not true question, that means three of these are true. So which of the following is not true? Let's look for the ones that are true about extinction. A, extinction should be implemented as consistently as possible in order to be effective. Is that true? Well, it is. We want extinction to occur as close to 100% of the time if we want it to be effective. That's one of the, the golden rules of extinction. As close to 100% of the time as possible. What about B? Implementing extinction inconsistently can change the reinforcement schedule of the target behavior. Is that true? Well, think about it. Let's say we have a behavior that's on an FR2 schedule. We put that behavior on extinction. And so the client engages in the response 10 times, and then we reinforce. What have we done? Well, we've changed that schedule from an FR2 to either now maybe an FR10 or even a variable schedule. So if you implement extinction inconsistently, you can go as far as changing the reinforcement schedule of the target behavior, which is why A is so important. So far, A and B are both true. C, if the behavior starts to increase during extinction, it is a sign that you should start checking your staff's treatment fidelity. Is that true? What do we typically expect to see with extinction? We expect to see an extinction burst. To get to an extinction burst, what do we expect to see? We expect to see the behavior increasing at the beginning. So the behavior increasing during extinction is not something we should be concerned about. It's something we should have planned for in the beginning. It's something we expect to happen. So C is not necessarily true. What about D? Extinction can lead to aggression, even if aggression was not present prior to the start of extinction. So extinction can lead to aggression if aggression was not present prior to the start of the extinction. Is that true? Well, that is true. Extinction-induced aggression is a thing. With an extinction burst, we expect the rate or the frequency or the magnitude of the current behavior to increase, and sometimes aggression can come along with that. So what is not true about extinction? Well, that's going to be C. If the behavior starts to increase during extinction. It is a sign that you should start checking your staff's treatment fidelity. All right, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you have not already. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.